Good morning, everyone. Christ is risen. He is truly risen. I hope you all had a beautiful and moving Easter celebrations. It gives me great pleasure to extend to all of you a very warm welcome on behalf of our bishops here present, the Vice Rector, Father Armando, and myself. We would like to warmly welcome each of you to the sixth annual Enrichment Days at the Maronite Seminary. It is an exciting time for our seminary as we continue to grow in inspiration and awareness. The seminary is an exciting place in which to work, study, and play. And we shall continue to meet and bring inspiring people together in forum like this. Before I close, I'd like to thank each of you for making every effort to attend this enriching conference. You as leaders have the vision, the knowledge, and the experience to help us pave our way into the future. You are truly our greatest asset today and tomorrow. And we could not accomplish what we do without your support and leadership. Throughout this conference, I ask you to stay engaged, keep us proactive, and help us shape the future of the church. My personal respect and gratitude go out to all of you. Welcome once again to the Maronite Seminary, and may you enjoy such a beautiful gathering and such a beautiful talk. Thank you. I'd like to start by uh, thanking our rector, Monsignor Peter Azar, uh, for uh, hosting this uh, Manor Enrichment Days. And as he said in his introduction, this is our sixth year that uh, we're doing it. And also I'd like to thank the bishops for their support of uh, this event. I thank all of you for attending, and I'd like to highlight that uh, Professor Robin Darling Young from the Catholic University is with us today. She teaches uh, Eastern spirituality and other things at Catholic University. Thank you for being with us. And I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. David uh, Michelson for accepting our invitation and being here with us today. Uh, to talk about Philoxenes of my book. Better? Thank you. So, Professor Michelson is Associate Professor of the History of Christianity at Vanderbilt University. He is an historian of Syria Christianity who has published on the history of Christology the history of monasticism, and the historical geography of the Syriac heritage communities. So based on this, he knows a lot about the Syriac world and the Syriac communities. He earned his PhD from Princeton University. He is the author of The Library of Paradise, a history of contemplative reading in the monasteries of the Church of the East. It's this book over here. And if you'd like to talk a little bit about it, uh, you know, he's, he's well, more welcome to do so. And he is the author of the Practical Christology of Philoxenes of my book, which is this book here. So I'm going to leave these books for you here if you'd like to have uh, to show that you use them. He has co he has co-edited two additional volumes, including Faith and Community Around the Mediterranean in honor of Peter R. L. Brown. Michelson has also been a leader in applying digital research methods to the study of and present preservation of Syriac cultural heritage through the publication of Syriaca.org, the Syriac reference portal, and other digital resources. Those who were here last year remember 
that Professor John Nicole uh, Menon uh, talked about it, and um, uh, she is an also a co-editor co with uh, Professor Michelson. Professor Michael, it's a pleasure to have you with us. The podium is all yours. Welcome. I'm just going to uh, put a little map up on the screen here. Uh, it is true that Syriac geography is one of the things I love. <clears throat> Let's see if we, we'll see if we succeed at this. Where is uh, Christian? Do you want to see if we can do it? <laughs> It may turn off in a moment, but uh, we have it for now. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm actually happy to uh, pass these around if anyone would like to look at them. It may be more interesting than listening to me, so if uh, you get bored, you can uh, at least... Uh, I managed to get Oxford to put colorful pictures on the front and the back of each book. Uh, only a few, because it's an academic book nonetheless. Um, <clears throat> well, it's really an honor to be here, uh, and even uh, a little intimidating, uh, Cor Bishop Vijani uh, was one of the, uh, whose book, first book on Syriac spirituality was one of the first books I read on Syriac uh, when I was just getting into it and uh, at the time had one of the few sections in English on Philoxenos and of course Professor uh, Robin Darling Young's dissertation uh, focused on Severus and Philoxenos so, uh, you know, the uh, two people who, whom I learned a lot about what I'm talking to you about are here, so uh, maybe I'll just sit down. Uh, uh, I also want to thank uh, Monsignor Azar and Reverend Dr. Armando El Curi, the bishops, the community of Our Lady of Lebanon Maronite Seminary uh, for this generous invitation to speak to you over the next two days about Philoxenos of Mabug. Uh, as you will learn, he is perhaps one of the most prolific writers ever in the history of Syriac literature. Had I known that, I would not have chosen it as a dissertation topic. Uh, nevertheless, in the spite of the efforts of some historians, uh, myself included, Philoxenos is still not as well known today as his influence on the history of Christian, the Christian faith demands he should be. Outside of the Syrian Orthodox Church, where he is commemorated as a saint, Philoxenos is known, if at all, uh, because of his role as a leader in the West Syrian opposition to the Council of Chalcedon. But I hope that you'll find over the next two days that Philoxenos' rich corpus and career were guided by a deep ascetic spirituality and a contemplative theology of which his writing on Christology was only really the tip of the iceberg. Uh, he was an author, a bishop, a monastic teacher, and a contemplative. Uh, and since A.D. 2023 marks the 1500th anniversary of Philoxenos' death, it's an appropriate moment to make him better known across ecclesial boundaries. Indeed, I want to say how honored I am to be part of a moment of sort of mutual ecumenical hospitality with all of you. 
I'm here, I'm a Protestant. I'm speaking to Maronites about a Syrian Orthodox saint. So uh, we've already uh, perhaps uh, set a little bit of an ecumenical record. Um, but really, I want to applaud you Maronites, your heirs and uh, caretakers of the Syriac heritage of the Peshitta, the West Syrian liturgy, the poetry of Mor Ephraim and others. Uh, and I'm uh, delighted to see that you have an awareness uh, of the importance for you to be engaged with neighboring Syriac Christian traditions, uh, such as the Syrian Orthodox Church. So uh, I want to also then state my gratitude to you as the perspective of someone concerned about the fate of Christianity in the West. Uh, I'm grateful not only that you are making strides in preserving and learning about your Syriac identity, but also that you're sharing it with the world. Um, the essential role of the Eastern churches in Vatican II is well known, but what I think is only becoming clear now is the ongoing benefit that your unique Aramaic witness to the gospel of Christ offers to Christians of all denominations. So, in that ecumenical spirit, let me encourage you to get to know Philoxenos over our two days together. While he was a theological opponent of Chalcedon and thus in conflict with early Maronites, he was also a pastorally minded bishop, a nuanced theologian, and a contemplative mystic deeply shaped by both the East and West Syriac traditions. So as such, I'm optimistic that there will be things about your own tradition you will be able to understand better through learning about Philoxenos and his legacy. Now, before we dive into Philoxenos, let me just give you an overview of what we'll cover in the four lectures uh, and set some expectations. So first of all, please be writing down questions as we go along. Uh, we have a generous half hour for discussion afterward and I certainly agree with you that listening to me for more than 60 minutes straight is more than anyone can take. Uh, just ask my teenage children if you uh, need, need someone to con confirm that. Uh, so please, uh, keep questions. I'll even pause at various points, and if you'd like to ask a question in the middle of the lecture, uh, I'm very happy for that. Uh, and more than just clarifications, of course, are welcome, but I'm keen to hear from you, uh, your own reactions, reflections on the topics uh, considered here. I'm an academic, I'm primarily teaching students in a classroom setting, but it's my hope that some of what you hear will be useful for you uh, in parishes, in congregations, uh, etc. So uh, in terms of topics, here's how the lectures will proceed. Uh, my first lecture, the goal is overview, to provide you with a historical introduction to Philoxenos' life and to his work as an author, to give you a sense of his Christology. We'll do all of that before lunch somehow. Uh, our second lecture this afternoon will take us into detail to consider Philoxenos' monastic context and his adaptation of the contemplative theology of Evagrius of Pontus. I really can't thank uh, uh, Father Vajani enough. Uh, the introduction to Syriac spirituality that you've just given us uh, all of those things can be found in Philoxenos, as you well know, but you've done the hard work for me of introducing all of these concepts uh, just now, so thank you. Um, in fact, that's really what I hope the goal of the two lectures today will be for you to see that, that while Philoxenos was mostly known for getting involved in the Christological debates, he was driven to it by his concerns about spirituality and to use a big academic term, uh, ep epistemology, or how does a Christian know God? And his understanding through the Syriac spiritual tradition of how one knows God then had implications for what you think of the incarnation. Uh, for our second day together then, I hope to put Philoxenos in the broader context of Syriac theology. Uh, in the third lecture, I'll identify his role in what I call ecumenical evagrianism. So a form of monastic spirituality which transcended doctrinal and confessional lines among the various Syriac communions in the Middle Ages. Uh, so I'll make the case that even though Philoxenos was, in my view, too sharp of an anti-Chalcedonian polemicist, he nevertheless is a monastic theologian whose contributions to the development of Syriac mystical theology uh, became a part of the tradition in the Church of the East, among Melkites, uh, uh, even uh, extending into Africa and China. Um, 
Finally, in our last lecture, I hope to inspire all of you towards further research uh, of your own. Um, so specifically, I will be introducing to you what I think is the most exciting and encouraging area in the growth of Syriac studies over the last two decades, the rise of digital tools and methods. Uh, even 20 years ago, when I began my dissertation, it would have only been a pipe dream to say, oh, I can just get on the internet and find what's in a manuscript. And now uh, there's something like 20,000 Syriac manuscripts waiting online. Now we just need to get more people learning Syriac to read them. Uh, so uh, in the last lecture, I will introduce you to some of these digital resources. Uh, pro tip for if the, the seminarians are here, if you have an assignment for a class, bring that. We can feed it into the databases uh, and see what happens. Um, and I'd really, in that last lecture, also like to, to brainstorm with you as representatives of the Maronite Church, what resources would be valuable for your church in terms of preserving the heritage and tradition, training future seminarians, uh, and even helping the faithful in the pew engage with uh, the heritage. So now let's turn to Philoxenos. I will try and cover three points in the time that remains here. First, I wanna offer a brief biographical outline of his life. Second, I'll introduce his writings. And third, I'll give you a sense of his involvement in the Christological controversies. Um, so we begin naturally with Philoxenos' biography. Let's see if I can make the uh, map reappear. There you go. Uh, you should also have a copy, I apologize for the small print, uh, there on your paper. From his birth in Persia to his exile and death in Thrace, which would be modern-day Bulgaria, Philoxenos' life spanned a remarkably varied geographic, political, and religious environment. Strategically positioned in his bishopric on the banks of the Euphrates, Philoxenos took on theological opponents both in Persia and Antioch, and was willing even to travel to Constantinople to the court of the emperor as needed. Uh, if you want to read more on Philoxenos' life after the lecture, of course I can refer to you to my own book, uh, but if you can read French, there's a much longer biographical study by André de Halle, Philoxène de Mabouk, Sa vie, ses écrits et sa, sa théologie. Uh, in addition for Philoxenos' works, and this is on the bibliography you have, uh, in 2010 I published a sort of update to de Halle's works listing all the known writings of Philoxenos. Uh, 2010, I guess, was 13 years ago, so my update now needs its own update, uh, if any of the students out there want, wish to do that. Um, and if you're interested in uh, the uh, traditional hagiography or saints' lives, um, probably the most accessible one is the 13th century Mimro by uh, a monk, Elio of Cartmine Monastery, uh, and there is a French translation by De Halle. Uh I may not have put that on the um, bibliography. Um, but so there are both modern uh, and traditional sources you can read. Um, for ease here, I've divided Phloxnos life into six phases, and that should help you grasp the general shape of his ministry and career as I trace them over. Um, these periods are his origins and education. We don't know exactly when he was born, sometime in the mid-fifth century. Uh, his active period in Antioch in the 470s and 80s his ordination as a bishop, and his early episcopate in Mabug. Uh, and then sort of the most uh, key years when he was active in the struggle for the anti-Chalcedonian cause, his campaign against the Chalcedonian patriarch Flavian uh, in the 490s and the 510s, uh, and then the patriarchate of Severus of Antioch, which really was the high point for the Miaphysite uh, cause in the region of Antioch and in some ways is sort of the origin point for what becomes the modern Syrian Orthodox Church. Of course, it traces its roots uh, apostolically back uh, to the prior bishops of Antioch, but it's in this period in which we can see its identity as a non-Chalcedonian West Syrian church uh, forming. Uh, and then finally, Philoxenos, uh, exile and death. So uh, his origins are somewhat obscure, but there are a few notable points. Uh, First, he was born in Sasanian Persia, most likely to an East Syrian family. So already Philoxenos himself uh, spans the, the breadth of the Syriac traditions. Uh, and uh, he was born in the region of Beth Garmai in the Tigris River, River Valley. You can see I've uh, marked it there on the map for you. Um, 
Uh, let's see here. Uh, at some point, we don't know when, he was educated in Edessa at the School of the Persians. This was the famous uh, Syriac uh, school in the period. And later polemics against Philoxenos alleged that at this point he was a diophysite, uh, a non-Chalcedonian diophysite belonging to the Church of the East. At some point, however, Philoxenos came to side with the Miaphysite Christology. And at this point here, I'll just uh, pause and sort of explain these terms. These are the terms that most historians prefer now to sort of describe the one nature and two nature Christology. So Miaphysis, one nature, Miaphysite, uh, diophysite, two natures. Um, of course, there are multiple diophysite views. So there are Chalcedonians, the, the Chalcedonian Christology involves two natures, uh, but then there are also the Church of the East, which are non-Chalcedonian or anti-Chalcedonian diophysites. In any case, when I uh, describe Philoxenos as a miaphysite throughout the lecture, you'll understand that that refers to his one nature, anti-Chalcedonian or non-Chalcedonian Christology. Uh, we don't know much else about uh, this early period. We know that the curriculum in Edessa would have involved reading the works of Evagrius and Ephrem for sure, uh, and so Philoxenos would have been familiar uh, with them. Uh, we do know a lot more about the Antioch period. So in the 470s, Philoxenos came to Antioch to grow, join a growing circle of anti-Chalcedonian agitators under the Miaphysite patriarch Peter the Fuller. Uh, at this point, Philoxenos became uh, involved in a dispute, uh, oh, a dispute sorry, over Peter's Miaphysite addition to the Trisagion hymn, uh, the Kadishat Aloho. Uh, the Miaphysite side added a phrase uh, about uh, God who was uh, crucified for us. Uh, this obviously provoked a controversy, such as any time adding something to the liturgy provokes a controversy. Uh, and this was sort of the, the central point uh, in those tumultuous years. I'm gonna list a bunch of names and dates. Uh, Father Armando said, I can't give you a quiz, so I guess you don't have to write the names and dates down. The reason for mentioning the names and dates is not that you need to remember all of these patriarchs and emperors. I want you to take away the, a sense of how in the 470s, 480s, 490s, this was such a tumultuous period in Antioch. Uh, it's unfortunately a period of uh, even violent uh, engagement between the, the Christological opponents. Um, uh, you know, I suppose an unfortunate parallel would be those of you who are, uh, you know, familiar with uh, the, the travails of modern day Lebanon, uh, you can understand how frequent changes of government, frequent changes in authority, made it very uncertain what might be happening next. And this was definitely such a period uh, as, as you'll see here. Um, so while, while in Antioch, Philoxenos experienced these rapid shifts in ecclesiastical and imperial authority. Uh, the first was in 475, 476, the emperor Zeno was challenged by a usurper named Basiliscus. And to gain support, Basiliscus uh, condemned the Council of Chalcedon. This led the patriarch Peter the Fuller to endorse Basiliscus as emperor. Needless to say, the reigning emperor Zeno wasn't a fan of this. And after he defeated Basiliscus, he deposed Peter from the Antiochene Patriarchate. It appears that Philoxenos remained in the vicinity of Antioch in this period. And this is when he began to uh, compose polemical letters, continuing this debate over the Trisagion, over the Kadishat Aloho. Uh, his letter to the monks on faith was written in this period, say, in 482, and we'll come back to that uh, text in a moment. It may be inferred from this letter that Philoxenos was a monk. Uh, the details aren't clear. It's not clear when he was ordained as a priest. Maybe uh, Professor uh, Young knows and can tell us, but uh, the year 482 brought another disruption. Tensions between the competing Miaphysite and Chalcedonian claims to the patriarchal throne in Antioch had heated up with the murder of the Chalcedonian patriarch Stephen II in 479. And in 482, the emperor Zeno issued the Hanatikon. Now, this is an interesting document. Many historians have referred to it as a sort of a gag order. In other words, the emperor said, okay, the, the fighting over Christology is such that uh, you're just not permitted to talk about Christology. Naturally enough, a, a patriarch had been murdered uh, and the Roman emperor's main job is to bring about peace. 
that's certainly a valid interpretation of what's going on. What I hope you will see, though, when we look at some quotes from Philoxenos later, is that actually this uh, sense of being quiet about Christology and avoiding making certain statements that Philoxenos felt actually were beyond human capacity to make was also a theological position. So the Miaphysites were fine with this gag order because in their view it was actually a mistake to talk too much or in too much detail about Christology. Uh, I don't think the Emperor Zeno thought he was necessarily making such a move, but that's how the Miaphysites uh, read what was happening. Uh, and, and this really goes to, again, I'm just so grateful for the summary of your book, goes to some of these themes of wonder, apophatic theology, so saying that there are certain places where words simply can't describe the mysteries of the Incarnation, the Trinity, etc. Um, and Philoxenos, uh, as you'll see, I hope, really draws on these. Um, let's see. Uh, nevertheless, the, uh, you know, like all politicians everywhere and their wishful thinking, the Henoticon did not actually end the debate over Christology. Uh, it just made it illegal. Uh, and <laughs> the, the new Chalcedonian patriarch, Calendion, was taking a hard line against the Miaphysites, and he expelled Philoxenos from the city in this point. Um, Philoxenos then was quite prolific in exile for a period of uh, two to three years, traveling from monastery to monastery, rallying support. It really appears that his strategy was go to the monasteries, uh, convince them of this apophatic uh, miaphysite view or of opposition to Christology. Um, and indeed, Philoxenos even traveled to Constantinople in 484 to lobby the emperor Zeno directly to depose the Chalcedonian patriarch, Calendion. Uh, and we have a profession of faith which he made to the emperor that survives from that audience. Um, perhaps most significantly, it was also in this period that Philoxenos began to write extended polemical or debate pieces. Uh, there's a Fenkitho, a volume against Habib, that came out in this period. Uh, and it's quite uh, complex. There's a letter by Philoxenos, a refutation by a Diophysite monk named Habib, two more replies by Philoxenos. Uh, one is short, like a normal sort of reply. The other is actually a series of 10 treaties, uh, which I guess maybe is the strategy is to win by write it out, writing at a greater volume than your opponent. Uh, and finally, and this is important, a lengthy florilegium or collection of quotations from earlier church fathers uh, that supported a one-nature Christology, so drawing from Cyril, Athanasius, um, etc. This volume really established Philoxenos' long-term reputation as a polemicist, and it seems that many of his writings then for centuries in the Syrian Orthodox Church served as sort of handbooks that could be used when Syrian Orthodox theologians or preachers would engage primarily with other Christian audiences, but of Chalcedonian or Church of the East uh, persuasion. Anyway, you won't be quizzed on all those names and dates. The main thing I want you to take away is this sense of turmoil, frequent turnover in political support. You know, from one day to the next, it wasn't clear, is the emperor going to support the Chalcedonians or the anti-Chalcedonians? And a lot of the harsh rhetoric came out of that period. Um, the other thing to flag uh, today, it can be quite jarring uh, to read much of this rhetoric uh, from the period, from all sides, in fact. Uh, it's important to remember that these Christological doctrines were just finding clear expression in this period. So today, when you might read them, you, you know, you're reading them a period of 1,500 years later, the church has long settled how exactly it wants to express some of these questions of the incarnation. But in this period, everything, even what turned out to be the orthodox expressions, seemed novel to everyone. Uh, this brings us to a third phase in Philoxenos' life, his elevation to the episcopacy. In 484, fortunes change again in Antioch, surprise. This time, the Chalcedonian patriarch makes the mistake of siding with an imperial usurper. Uh, and when the Emperor Zeno yet again regains control, he deposes Calendion, the Chalcedonian patriarch, and actually restores Peter the Fuller, the one he had deposed before. <laughs> I guess if both patriarchs have sided with another emperor, you still you have to pick one or something. Uh, so in addition, Zeno deposed nine other bishops in the Diocese of the Orients. Uh, let's see if we can call this up. 
Uh, so you can sort of see on the map there where it says Euphratensis, that's the diocese of the Orient. So these are all bishops who are under the patriarch uh, of Antioch. It's oh, not up. It's not up? No. We'll see. Uh, well, we'll we'll rely on uh, you have it on your on your own map there. Um, I've tried to only mark places on the map that are relevant to Philoxenos. Um, so in this period, then Philoxenos is really the leader of a group of bishops uh, under the patriarch Peter the Fuller, uh, who are agitating for uh, Christological the, the Miaphysite Christology. As he settled into his episcopal duties in Mabug Hierapolis, Philoxenos had time to devote to writing. In the period from 485 to 498, he wrote his most elaborate Christological treatise, a lengthy book of sentences, and also perhaps his most developed ascetic writings, the discourses. I've actually brought Bob Kitchen's excellent English translation of the discourses. Uh, I'll pass this around. Again, if my talks are too boring, this book is good for your soul. So, uh, uh, so this is a series of um, ascetic discourses that we'll turn back to. Um, Philoxenos also gave his attention in this period to cultivating this Christian community under his pastoral care. Uh, Hierapolis, or Mabug, was uh, at this period still the cult center for the worship of the Syrian goddess Atargatis. So uh, it appears that Philoxenos continued, uh, contributed to the increasing Christianization of the city. He also established several new monastic communities throughout his diocese. Uh, these, some of you, you can see on the map there. Um, and many of these are small, five to 10 monks it seems. But it did include one large new monastic establishment, the Monastery of Senun near Edessa, that Philoxenos was very proud of at the end of his life. In the same period, he continued his efforts to oppose the Council of Chalcedon under the banner of the Hanatikon. Uh, Zeno was succeeded in this period by the Emperor Anastasius. And while Anastasius' ecclesiastical politics were uh, relatively neutral, he was not opposed to the Miaphysites and, in fact, uh, encouraged their expansion. Uh, again, just a reflection of what a tumultuous time this was. The Emperor Anastasius was actually previously up in the running as a candidate for Patriarch of Antioch. So, uh, again, you can just sort of see what a, what a sort of tumultuous period it was. Um, I'll leave it to the bishops here to say whether he got a better or worse job uh, by becoming emperor. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. The other thing to note is that from Mabug, Philoxenos also kept alert to the spread of diophysite theology in Persia. So you can see where the Roman frontier is marked on the map there. Uh, and so Philoxenos is active not only in the eastern Mediterranean, but also beyond the Roman borders. Um, the Miaphysite missionary Simeon of Beth Arsham reported that Philoxenos even ordained the first two bishops of Najran on the Arabian Peninsula, including the martyr bishop Paul II. Uh, so on the little blow-up map I've put where uh, Najran is there down on the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and most significantly uh, for the Miaphysite ascendancy in this period, it was Philoxenos and his five loyal suffragan bishops in Euphratensis who formed the core of leadership leading to Severus of Antioch's eventual ordination. Uh, so how did this come about? Well, in 498, a pro-Chalcedonian, Flavian, was made Patriarch of Antioch, and Philoxenos, who is now sort of the senior Miaphysite bishop, uh, led the opposition to unseat Flavian. This period is also, though, I want to note, a really prolific period for Philoxenos as an author and scholar. He set up a scriptorium, so a, a manuscript production and scholarly center in Mabug, whose crowning achievement was a fresh translation of the New Testament from Greek into Syriac, completed in 507 or 508. And based on this translation, Philoxenos himself wrote mm, sort of commentaries, we'll come back to what they really were, on Matthew, Luke, and John using this new Syriac translation of the New Testament. He also wrote quite a few letters to monks in this period. Um, and so from Philoxenos' letters, we can see 
that uh, he's focused both on Antioch, but also on the church in Persia. In fact, in 502, 505, the Roman Empire is at war with Persia. Philoxeno Sea of Mabug is the main garrison town on the border. So he must have been bishop of a city that often was filled uh, with Roman soldiers. Uh, and indeed, in this period, he's really involved in some interesting missionary work. He sends the missionary I already mentioned, Simeon of Beit Arsham, to Armenia. Uh, and he even writes a letter to the Lachmed Philarch. This is the ruler of the Arab Lachmed tribe, who's actually the main leader uh, of the Persian ally in the period. And Philoxenos is seeking to convert them to Miaphysite Christianity. Um, in any case, uh, Philoxenos did seem to enjoy imperial support, and he started to convene councils to depose uh, the Chalcedonian Patriarch of Antioch. There's a council in Antioch in 509, a council in Sidon in 511, uh, and eventually he does succeed in having Flavian the Patriarch deposed, which leads us to, on our uh, list of the periods of his life, the Patriarchate of Severus of Antioch. Now, Severus of Antioch's reputation as a theologian soon grew more prominent than Philoxenos, so to some degree, maybe Severus of Antioch has eclipsed Philoxenos. But I think it's really important to note that Philoxenos was the senior and seasoned advisor to Severus in this period. We can see from their letters, they're, they're taking advice from one another. And the most interesting thing here is because up to this point, the polemics have been very harsh. There's been a lot of violence. Once they actually were in power, Philoxenos and Severus called for a change in tactics. Rather than polemics, they had to strike a moderate tone, which they wanted to do because they were trying to consolidate Miaphysite control of the churches in Syria and Anatolia. One pressing question was, would they receive the formerly Chalcedonian clergy and bishops back into communion? And it may be surprising to hear that in such cases, both leaders, Philoxenos and Severus, advocated against disrupting the church through the mass depositions of popular bishops abbots or clergy. In other words, they may have learned the lesson of this period that they had lived through where people were constantly being deposed. Instead, they drew upon the concept of accommodation, or in Syriac, medabronutho, or in Greek, economia. Sometimes we in English will render this economy. Unfortunately, in our American mass consumer society, it has nothing to do with what economy you think of when I say economy to you. But this sense of divine accommodation in the way that God condescends to human beings, adapting to human weakness, uh, this medabronutho is what Philoxenos encouraged Severus to practice, uh, not to undertake a fruitless effort to depose popular bishops, which might not succeed anyway. He argued that such an action would humiliate the patriarch if it couldn't be carried out, and it would hurt the Miaphysite cause by sowing discord. He made a similar flexible appeal to Medabronutho or economy with regard to the liturgical practice of reading the names of bishops, both living and dead, before the consecration of the Eucharist. Now, in general, Philoxenos and Severus sought to limit communion to those who accepted the Miaphysite doctrines, but making this a reality in the list of bishops was a difficult task. A strict policy would have meant removing the names of popular bishops, some of whom had, who had died before the battle lines over Christology were even drawn. Uh, so as Philoxenos pointed out, the notable fourth century Orthodox figures, including Basil of Caesarea and Miletius of Antioch, had themselves actually been ordained by one, one time or former Arians. So his argument was, okay, look, if it didn't bother Basil that he was ordained by a former Arian, uh, we don't need to be so strict. Uh, we should have a pastoral concern instead. Uh, this brings us to the final period of Philoxenos' life. A Miaphysite ascendancy, which culminated in Severus' ordination, was short-lived. In 518, guess what? There's another emperor, Justin I, and he declares himself in favor of the Chalcedonians. Severus, Philoxenos, and most of the Miaphysite hierarchy were pushed out of their churches and driven into exile in Philippopolis, that's modern-day Plovdiv in Bulgaria. Uh, nevertheless, even in these last four years of his life, Philoxenos continued one of his main activities, writing letters to monks, encouraging them uh, in their ascesis and in their commitment to a Miaphysite approach to Christology. He died in 523 under house arrest while in exile. 
Um, there are later reports that he was murdered. This seems difficult to substantiate. In any case, the stress of deportation combined with old age uh, likely was the cause of death. Uh, due to Philoxeno's prolific writings and his successful leadership of the Syriac Miaphysites, his reputation only continued to grow after his death. Numerous 6th, 7th, 8th century manuscripts survive with portions of his work. Indeed, due to the changing circumstances of how manuscripts from this period survive, the early manuscript evidence for Phylloxenos works is unprecedented. Now, forgive me, this is the historian in me getting really excited. We actually have three manuscripts which survived from Phylloxenos' own library and scriptorium in Mabuk. Just to like make up a Western example, this would be as if I told you I managed to find three books from St. Benedict's Monastery Library, right? Like that, that just would be impossible. But for some reason in this period, uh, Syriac manuscripts tend to survive somewhat earlier than Greek and Latin manuscripts. And so we actually have three manuscripts from Philoxenos' own uh, library that survive. Uh, this concludes the biographical summary. Hopefully these periods give you the sense of the development of his life, uh, the concerns he was involved in, and most importantly, the many roles that he played. Experienced bishop, proven monastic leader, rigorous theologian, learned exegete, prolific polemicist, would-be imperial counselor, uh, etc. Uh, I want to go on and talk about his works next and give you a sense of his Christology, but let's just take just a brief moment right there and see if there are any questions uh, before we move on. That was pretty deep. <laughs> I'm sure, <laughs> yes. So the, uh, the uh, manuscripts found, were they written by his hand? <clears throat> Probably not. Uh, the, the, so two of them are not of his works. Uh, one of them I think might be, uh, is like a florilegium. Uh, one is his work, but I think that its date is something like 520. My, so maybe it's like the first time it was copied. My question is, did he, did Ephraim, did mm. James of Sarug write their own text, or did someone write them for them? <clears throat> that's like the school of Ephraim. Yeah, that's a terrific question. Certainly, Philoxenos has his own distinct style. Whether he, you know, dictated them orally and a scribe wrote them down, uh, I couldn't say. Um, we certainly know that later uh, in the Syrian Orthodox Church, Jacob of Edessa, I believe that we do have uh, texts from his own hand, but of course, he also was trained as a scribe and had a lot to say about how scribes should do their work, etc. cetera. <laughs> um, so, uh, but um, I wouldn't be surprised, perhaps, if, if he wrote them, but certainly he had the whole scriptorium. Uh, just to be clear, he didn't do the New Testament translation. That was done by uh, a corpuscopus named Polycarp. Um, it's not clear that Philoxenos actually knew Greek or, you know, knew Greek fluently. Um, but yes, excellent question. So, uh, just a quick follow-up on this one. So if he did not know Greek fluently, then his exposure to Evagrius was a uh, Syriac translation of Evagrius? Yes. Come back this afternoon and tomorrow morning for more on that. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, check the... Uh... I'm, I'm joking. I'm here. <laughs> um, but yes, so is uh, actually the unique uh, Syriac re reception of Evagrius, which is in some substantial ways different from what Evagrius himself uh, wrote. Could, could you elaborate on... I, I didn't quite catch with regard to Peter the Fuller and, you know, the who was crucified for us. Yeah. What um, Philoxenus's position was with regard to that? So, uh, the argument there is about expressing that it's uh, the full union of humanity and divinity in Christ who experienced the suffering of the right. crucifixion. So, the technical theological term is the Theo Theopashite. So the argument is, you know, holy God, holy immortal, who right. was crucified for us, right. which for uh, some Chalcedonians and certainly Diophysites in the Church of the East right. would have been problematic because it implies that God is suffering in some way. Right. I, I just didn't, I, I didn't quite catch if Philoxenus was therefore in, in support yes. of the, the 
the addition, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. For the, for the Miaphysites, it's important for the work of salvation that God fully experience humanity so that God can fully redeem and restore humanity to this new, this new image of Christ, that you, this future, future humanity of Christ uh, that we heard about earlier. If, basically, if Christ in his humanity did not die with, with that connection being that Miaphysite, uh, uh, the incarnate word, is not crucified, then we, we aren't saved. That's right. That's an argument that they're getting from Cyril of Alexandria right. and also from some slightly more dodgy sources than Cyril yeah. of Alexandria, but uh, definitely from Cyril. All right. I just wasn't sure. that I, I didn't quite catch when I was taking my little notes oh, here good. That, well, that, that, that if he was in support of yes. the Fuller's uh, yes. position. Yes. So okay. that's the Miaphysite position in right. favor of the Theopashite or the suffering of God theology. Yeah. Um, uh, Let's get into, oh yeah, go ahead. Um, just a, on a personal level, I'm just curious if you wouldn't mind sharing um, what led you to dig deeper into what oh. is the Winsome Age Fascinator or intriguing you found about it? Yeah, that's great. And actually, that is a good segue to what we're going to do next. Uh, I don't know if my parents will listen to this recording, but if they do, uh, uh, most of my parents are academics, and so I grew up in a very unusual home. And among the things that we would joke about was Miaphysite, Diophysite, Chalcedonian. So I was probably the only seventh grader who had ever heard of Monophysites, uh, at least in rural Indiana where I grew up. Uh, so when I got to graduate school, I'm like, oh, well, okay, I know what that is. These are people who are like counting natures, and some of them say there are two natures, and some of them say there are one natures. It's like a kind of theological math problem. But also by that point, I had been to seminary, and I knew well, you know, there are problems in the church, but hopefully people aren't dedicating their life to theological math problems. There must be something deeper going on here. And the answer that I really came to find and that I argue for in the book is that for Philoxenos at least, whether rightly or wrongly, we could debate that, but he felt that the Chalcedonian Christology threatened his understanding of how human beings have access to knowing God. So it wasn't about, oh, you know, it's a math problem and the answer is one or the answer is two. It was the way that these people are describing the incarnation, you know, invalidates the way that I think one approaches knowing God. Uh, and, and that's actually what we'll go to in a moment. Yeah, so the, these are actually the quotes that we'll, uh, we'll look at um, mainly in the lecture this afternoon. Um, but but let me introduce some of the key themes now. Um, I do want to just say real briefly, you have a list of the kinds of works which Philoxenos um, wrote. Uh, I've identified 62 authentic works, and by I, I mean I built on the work of André de Alleux, who identified the majority of them. Um, there are also 21 other works attributed to Philoxenos, um, but likely not written by him. And so these 83 works are quite a large number. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Philoxenos' works and sometimes just his name traveled well beyond Syrian Orthodox boundaries. At least one work, his letter to Patricius, ends up in Greek manuscripts under the name of Isaac of Nineveh. In addition, the commentaries of the East Syrian author Dadisho of Qatar eventually circulate in Arabic and in Ethiopic under the name of Philoxenos. So we'll come back to this in our lecture uh, tomorrow morning, but what I want you to see is that, you know, there's both Philoxenos, the active scholar, writer, bishop, but also Philoxenos, the, the legacy of this medieval saint, uh, whose name then, uh, you know, is literally known in Ethiopia uh, and beyond. Um, I won't go into uh, the individual works because I want to instead get to uh, talking to you about um, his Christology. I will just say that uh, there is an excellent published edition of uh, all of the um, published works of Philoxenos in Syriac with a modern Arabic translation by the Syrian Orthodox Bishop Severios, uh, Dairoyo Roger Akras. Uh, so if you uh, can read Syriac or Arabic, that would be excellent. Um, and that edition is about 500,000 words. So 
Um, just for a point of reference, my Phylloxenos book, I think, is 100,000 words, so five of, five of those books or, or more. Um, Father Armando may suggest that Jacob of Sarug wrote more than that, and it may turn out that you're right. Uh, but at least in the moment, this means that more works by Phylloxenos have survived, perhaps other than maybe Ephraim or Jacob or, uh, you know, as much as. Um, so even just for that reason, uh, I really would encourage you to make yourself familiar with him as one of the most prolific Syriac uh, authors. Um, but let's look at his Christology uh, in the time that remains, and, and I definitely want to make sure we have time uh, for some more questions. Thank you for asking that uh, personal question. I, I definitely uh, would like to come back to that further, too. Um, okay, Philoxenos Christology has been studied in detail by André de Alleu, and more recently by Tanios Bou Mansour. Uh, you can see those in the bibliography. Um, and both scholars forefront what they call the intuitive character of Philoxenos. So again, uh, the point you made about this is not the world of the scholastics uh, really applies. He's writing about Christology, but he's not writing a systematic theology here. Um, so he was not an analytic or systematic theologian, uh, doesn't even adhere to particular philosophical method. He seems to be guided by an allegiance to certain fundamental convictions about human beings, how human beings should or could know God. And uh, this really shapes all that he says about Christology. Now, judging by the pages filled and energy spent, there's little doubt that the Christological debates were important to Philoxenos. Um, Yet, there really is just a small core set of Christological concepts uh, which seem to remain constant over all of these works. And you have a list of them there uh, in, the, in your handout. And again, uh, Core Bishop Bajani already mentioned most of these in his survey. So uh, go and get that book to read on background. So again, it's not that Philoxenos is inventing these terms. He is receiving them from the contemplative tradition of wonder and awe and faith and simplicity that he inherits from Ephraim, uh, Afrahat, and others. Um, okay, let's see here. Oops, I've lost my... Uh, ah, right. Uh, there is one, one sort of warning I want to make here. Um, the most striking aspects of Philoxenos writings are their opposition to doctrinal speculation and an emphasis on the human limits of knowledge. On the one hand, this is, suggests a little inconsistency in that Philoxenos spent so much of his life writing theological treaties about the limits of theological knowledge. Uh, on the other hand, it cannot be de denied that Philoxenos consistently and across all the genres of his works pointed his readers away from speculative theology towards practical or practice-based spirituality. So spiritual practices, especially methods of ascesis, uh, and contemplation, and towards a mystical, uh, if we'll allow that word, I know it's a kind of hard word to define, a mystical encounter or apprehension of God. Indeed, this is the central paradox in the intellectual world of Philoxenos. Um, I'm going to just discuss a few uh, of his works here. Uh, these aren't on your handout. The, hand, the quotes are really for this afternoon, but this will just sort of whet your appetite uh, for what's to come. Uh, Philoxenos wrote a letter to monks on faith. This was before he became a bishop, and uh, it's about the Theopashite controversy. He uh, argued that the unity of the incarnation had to include the divine nature experiencing suffering and death. He acknowledged that some might be troubled by the statement, God was crucified for us, but he argued that such a paradoxical becoming uh, in which God seemingly defies God's own divine nature was essential for the economy of salvation. He wrote, The Ancient of Days became a child. The Most High became an infant in the womb, and God became man. The Spiritual One became bodily. The Invisible One was seen. The Intangible One was handled. Invisible, we see him. Not tangible, we handle him. Not capable of being eaten, we eat him. Not capable of being tasted, we drink him. We embrace him who is all-powerful. We kiss him who is infinite. Of him who is immortal, we believe that he died for us. Of him who cannot suffer, we confess that he suffered for us. 
So I hope you can get a sense here of this core paradox uh, of the incarnation for Philoxenos. So that's a work uh, written before he became bishop. At the end of his life from exile, we have a very similar work. So showing sort of how these threads of his Christology uh, remain constant. This letter, the letter to the monks of Senun, begins by talking about the central concept of incarnation as becoming. Philoxenos proceeds to what it means for salvation, this sense of becoming that he finds in the phrase in John 1.14, the word became flesh, and in Philoxenos' translation, dwelt in us. So uh, the bond there in Syriac can, can mean, uh, uh, could be translated amongst, but he wants to translate it uh, as in. Uh, following Alexandrian tradition, Philoxenos argued that through the incarnation, the unique son of God became human and by his act opened the possibility for all humankind to become children of God through a restoration or recreation of human nature in the new pattern of Christ, where, quote, this is Philoxenos, God is man and man becomes God. Having explained the why of the incarnation, Philoxenos raises the question of how. But here he insists this is a question that cannot be answered due to the limits of human knowledge and the deficiency of natural ability to comprehend the miracle of the incarnation. Following on this argument, Philoxenos condemns those at Chalcedon for their lack of humility concerning human knowledge and their futile efforts to explain the miracle of the incarnation. He defends the reality of the incarnation based on Nicene Trinitarian doctrine. He argued that the crucified Christ must be considered as fully one of the Trinity. One of Philoxenos' favorite arguments is to say, if we separate out the human and the divine in Christ, then is the human part not part of the Trinity? Are we saying that there's a quaternity? This is his favorite sort of trap he likes to set for his opponents. <laughs> uh, to support his position, Philoxenos then, in this letter, introduces a lengthy florilegium collection or collection of patristic quotations which situate opposition to Chalcedon as an extension of Nicene orthodoxy. This is really, I think, important. Philoxenos is certainly a follower of Cyril of Alexandria, but even more importantly, especially in his early years, he views himself as continuing Ephrem's po polemics against the Arian. Uh, Ephrem would argue that the appropriate thing to do in the face of uh, the Trinity and the Incarnation is to wonder, is to worship, not to ask how the mystery, you know, how is this mystery possible? Um, Philoxenos argues that the paradox of the Trinity provides the model for understanding the mystery of the incarnation, particularly the simplicity and unity of the persons of Christ and the Father. Just as the Father is simple, i.d. perfect, so simple here means like not made out of multiple things, so the incarnate Christ also could not be a divided being, but must have one simple unified nature. Now, just to be clear here, Philoxenos is not saying that Christ only has a divine nature. That's sometimes a mistake that's made in understanding the Miaphysite position. Christ has one nature that is simultaneously human and divine, but it's still one. It's the unity that's important for Philoxenos. Uh, Philoxenos' letter offers the reader ready access to the core Christological ideas which De Alleu and Boumassur have identified as persisting across the whole Philoxenian corpus of writings becoming the economy or medabronutho of salvation, unity and the Trinity, the mystery of the incarnation, faith and simplicity. So Philoxenos sort of sets up a, a dichotomy. The Christian proceeds in simple faith, the heretic proceeds in error and heresy. Um, we're almost out of time here, so I just wanna uh, uh, highlight a few of these terms very briefly. Um, we've already mentioned becoming. This is probably Philoxenos' favorite word uh, for describing both the incarnation but also the theosis of the human being. Christ becoming human so that humans can become into the divine image of Christ. Um, the economy of salvation we'll return to in our discussion this afternoon, um, but this really refers to God's working of providence. Uh, this word, medabronutho, in Syriac is so rich. It can mean providence, it can mean good <coughs> caretaking, it can mean God's plan of salvation. Um, it, it's a, it really, we could spend four hours on that. Um, unity and Trinity again. Uh, this is what I just mentioned to you. The unity of Christ's natures is important for Philoxenos 
because it's tied to the unity of the Trinity. Uh, lastly, the mystery, uh, well, no, not quite lastly, two, two more, the mystery of the incarnation. Following a similar pattern, Philoxenos' polemics against the Diophysites eventually always tend to circle back around to the paradox of the incarnation. The fact that there's a gulf between the creature and creator is a sort of impossible distinction, right? The, the creator cannot be the creature. The creature cannot be the creator. That's the fundamental order of reality, and yet that it has been bridged in the incarnation. Uh, this mystery of the incarnation served as sort of the, the irreducible core of Philoxenos Christology, a mystery that cannot be explained or elaborated through human knowledge. To the monks of Senun, he argued, the misquote, this is Philoxenos, the mystery of the union is incomprehensible. The act of the assumption is ineffable, inexpressible, because that which occurs in the divine uh, union is miraculous and cannot be caught by the mind of creatures. So in Philoxenos' view, the incarnation was an act which rested beyond the limits of human knowledge. It was accessible only through revelation. So the words of John 1.14 can tell you that it happened, but, or you could experience it through baptism and the Eucharist, very important to Philoxenos. But the mysterious access to the divine that's made possible by the incarnation can only be approached in humility and with wonder and cannot be subject to human explanation or speculation. Which brings us then to the last category, faith and simplicity. So for Philoxenos, it should come as no surprise that the way forward is through faith and in simplicity. Philoxenos followed here a friend's pro-Nicene polemics accusing the Arians of falling into error through their desire, their illicit desire to investigate the incarnation. For Philoxenos, the only result of such human-guided attempts to explain the how of the incarnation would be to fall into error. Against this rationalist stance of his opponents and their Christologies, Philoxenos advocated approaching the mystery of the incarnation through the eyes of faith, a spiritual sixth sense for Philoxenos. Faith, Philoxenos, paired with simplicity as the state of mind that the soul was enabled uh, to then gain knowledge of Christ. Uh, in this regard, Philoxenos Christological polemic does not actually offer at times an explicit Christology. Uh, his polemics were marked by a call to faith, simplicity, and the direct revelation of the mystery of the incarnation. Philoxenos certainly did favor a one-nature Christology, but it's not actually the number one or even counting the natures that interest him. He's interested mainly in opposing those who, guided by a spirit of what he would call speculative error, are diverting the faithful away from encountering Christ in the incarnation. So, to conclude, as Philoxenos saw it, the post-Chalcedonian controversies were less a question of conflicting doctrinal formulations and more a matter of competing understandings of how one knows God. While he did object to Diophysite Christology, it was actually more their method than their conclusion that bothered him. In this regard, the importance of knowing God for Philoxenos Christology becomes clear, and we'll dig into that in the afternoon. I uh, invite your questions, reflections, comments. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Um, and please, folks, remind me of, of your names, and we've already met twice. Yes, I'm Father Claude Franklin. Father Claude, thank you. Um, when you mentioned something, it then sparked some... Great, my, and that, it, I'm my, very my anxious to hear that. days of uh, reading things. Um, when you mentioned about John 1, 14, and you said in Philoxus... Philoxenus's uh, translation, which brought to my mind the Philoxian uh, New Testament. New Testament. Yep. First of all, do we know it's truly attributed to him? I mean, that he could, kind of goes back to what you were saying about writing, or right. or did maybe he like dictate it? And was was it affected by that translation by some of the Christological uh, issues? Great. Was, he, was he translating in a particular way? or You've just set up the afternoon lecture, oh, so okay. thank you. Uh, no, no, ha happy to answer that. So just to clarify, we call it the Philoxenian New Testament. Yeah. Uh, it's actually done by a core bishop named Polycarp. Okay. Um, and it even says that in the, the, the evidence okay. that we have. So it's not like Philoxenos was claiming credit right. 
uh, for it. Sadly, the, the Philoxenian New Testament itself doesn't actually survive. That's right, the Harclians. Uh, right, the Harclians surpassed it. Um, and we just have, you know, whatever quotations where Philoxenos quotes it, we can kind of say, okay, is this from something he wrote after the New Testament translation was completed? Then he's probably using it. Um, you know, of course his position no doubt influenced the text. I would say... Uh, we don't have enough of it to know, like, you know, did he skew it in some direction? Right. What I'll talk about this afternoon is, actually, Philoxenos' objection to the Peshitta, and, of course, here he's pushing back against what's one of the gems of the Syrian, uh, Syriac Christian traditions, is that the Peshitta is sometimes too easy to understand. So for, <laughs> for, so for Philoxenos, the places where the Greek gets complex, the purpose of that is to remind you that you're dealing with a mystery and maybe shouldn't go too far in trying to explain the complexity. Mm. Instead, you know, don't ask, how did God become human? Just worship because, you know, God chose to do this. So is he looking then at the Peshitta more like a Targum, in a sense, like that it's trying to explore, like, explain in the lines, but yes. making it more simple? Is yes, he, he, he actually objects. I think I'll read this quote this afternoon. He objects that he feels that the Peshitta translators sometimes chose what they thought fit the language uh -huh. rather than letting God just use the words that God chose to use. Uh -huh. um, it, it would be interesting, this is not my area of expertise, it would be interesting for, you know, the study of literal understandings of scripture. And of course, you know, later when we get to Islam, uh, you know, the, the, very, the, the specific words of the Quran take on an even greater significance than specific words of scripture do in, in a certain sense mm -hmm. uh, in Christianity. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't feel that the uh, version itself is sort of compromised because it does seem to really place an emphasis on just being a sort of wooden or literal rendering of the Greek. Partly what happened in this period was as the Syriac churches got involved in these debates uh, from Nicaea onward, they feel at a disadvantage, you know, they go to a debate and here are the Greeks with the Greek New Testament and here's the Peshitta not saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they have to uh, uh, come to a realization, of, okay, in some places the Peshitta doesn't fully express what's in the Greek. Because it could lead you to a different conclusion. Right, right. right. Yeah. Now, to be fair, sometimes the Greek doesn't fully express what's in the Aramaic. I noticed in the <laughs> lectionary reading for last Sunday, where Mary says Rabboni, the Greek just says, which means teacher and doesn't include my teacher. So right. uh, in some places, the, 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 uh, you know, the Greek didn't fully get the Aramaic. Uh, this is off topic, but uh, Professor Darling Young may remember. In one debate, they want to settle some verse and they go to the tomb of either Barnabas, I think Barnabas on Cyprus, and they excavate his tomb and pull a Bible out of it so they can check a verse <laughs> on the grounds of this version was buried in the tomb. It must be like an authoritative version. So it's just a period where people are really interested in, you know, checking the text of Scripture. I hope they returned it. Yeah, I do too. I, I, I'm actually, you know, uh, we have uh, our, our bishops here, you know, what level of authority does it take to uh, exhum an apostolic tomb and uh, check, the, <laughs> check the scriptures. Uh, you, you were mentioning about, in, in some ways, it's one nation, but two faces of our own divine and the human, mm -hmm. which is, I think that's when they talk about one person with two natures. Right. And, and, you know, it's interesting, uh, in some ways, more linguistic discussion more than theological discussion. Yeah. Yes, yes. In, in fact, in much of the modern ecumenical dialogue, and I would really congratulate the Roman Catholic Church, partly because of, of her Eastern Rite churches has led the way now in saying, I think today many scholars would say, look, this was two different languages coming at the same paradox from different directions. Certainly, for example, the, the pontifical agreement signed with the Armenians who are also Miaphysite that really was the core core of that. Another question. And the Syriacs too. Yeah. There's a right. Question there. But my, my question for Philoxenus, Philoxenus, true God and true man, correct? Yes. For Chalcedon, true God and true man. Yes. Uh, but you said something very important earlier that, and, and this, this is really the essence of the question. 
if God became man, then also God suffered and God died. That, that paradox is really essential. And, it's, and that's what Philoxenus was fighting for. And his point is that you have to come to that logical conclusion, even though it's a paradox. Otherwise, the faith loses something very valuable. And that is that that's his point, right? Yes, that that's exactly uh, the core for him. Uh, I would say there's sort of two things. One, salvation is at stake. If if we say, and he gets this from Cyril. So what Cyril argues is. Okay, in the Eucharist, we are receiving God, Cyril of Alexandria, not Cyril of Jerusalem, though Cyril of Jerusalem does a similar thing. In the Eucharist, we're receiving God into ourselves. But if we fully distinguish the human and divine, well, then you're actually just receiving the human body of Christ in the Eucharist, which would invalidate what, you know, the Miaphysites and the Alexandrian school would argue. The other thing I would flag is, uh, and this may be helpful for thinking about the controversy. Uh, naturally enough, uh, you know, as Catholics, uh, you're Chalcedonians, and we're all here in the West. So when we think of of uh, the controversy as being the Miaphysites versus the Chalcedonians, for Philoxenos, remember he's born in Persia of Church of the East origins. Really, for him, it's Theodore of Mopsuestia and the the Church of the East Diophysite thinking that he thinks will eventually win the day because of the Chalcedonian Creed. So uh, it would be a mistake to think of this as sort of Philoxenos versus Pope Leo and his tome. Philoxenos doesn't have nice things to say about Leo and his tome, just to be clear. But it, for Philoxenos, he's really more concerned about the Mesopotamian uh, debate over natures. And the Church of the East does distinguish the, na the two natures, uh, perhaps the furthest of any of of the communions. That's why the Muslims down the line, they're going to say, should be happy in Arabic, which means he looked like he suffered, but the reality didn't suffer, you know, about Christ. And, and that is maybe what Philoxenos, you know, he's not obviously uh, not directly anticipating the rise of Islam, but it's that sort of concern, you know, if we go down this road of distinguishing the natures, then, you know, these sorts of things would be possible. Because Chalcedon is like a slippery slope for him, right? Yes, I think I think that that's a fair way fair way to put it. I mean, the other thing we should remember: uh, all of these creeds and councils, as beneficial as they are to the church, are also tools used by the Roman Empire for its own ends as well, which aren't always the same as the ends of of uh, Christ and His Church. Uh, talking about suffering and dying. Uh, don't we have to distinguish don't we have to distinguish between philosophical concepts ordinary language and symbol and so uh, if we use ordinary language when really we're using it as symbol we have to recognize that so here again when we say the the uncreated suffers and dies what are we really saying we're, we're, now, we're now using symbol. We're not using ordinary language and certainly not using concept. And so, again, we're back to that whole issue about we're dealing with something beyond our understanding, but we think we're on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree completely. Uh, Philoxenos has almost nothing positive to say about philosophical concepts. I think it's interesting, uh, and several scholars, Luke Van Rompuy most notably, have pointed out that uh, there's intense pressure on Syriac theology from Greek in this period. And Philoxenos is an example of this, right? He feels it's necessary to retranslate the whole New Testament so as to be closer to Greek, and yet he's deeply concerned and worried about the, you know, the authority of Greek philosophical concepts, and he rejects them. It is interesting, he alternates between using popular language and being opposed to it. So in some cases, he's opposed to popular phrasing in the uh, 
Peshitta, he actually even apologizes for Ephraim towards the end of his life. He says, okay, Ephraim was able to use the language of putting on a body, but you know, he was speaking informally. You know, we're not, we're not actually saying that God put on a body in that sense because that would imply that it could be, you know, taken off or something, you know, that the union wasn't real. And you're right, he's completely speaking in uh, this world of, of types and the symbols of the church, which is what he would have been deeply steeped in, in the Syriac tradition. It's interesting with Ephraim, uh, where he talks about while uh, Christ was dying on the cross, he was uh, creating new human beings. Uh, and so we're talking about divinity dying and yet still very much alive. Paradox. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Other questions? Please. Maybe you're going to get to this a little bit later, but as I reflect, I'm part of the dialogue with Dr. Robin, myself, and a few others. Oriental Orthodox Catholic dialogue. Um, we are closer, out of all the, all the churches, if there's ever, ever going to be unity, the Oriental, Catholic, Oriental Orthodox and the Catholics are closer to dialogue. The issue is still Chalcedon. I'm wondering, after Monsignor Seeley's point, could, I mean, these words are limited. Our symbols are limited. Our approach is limited. Could a Philoxenus approach and a Chalcedonian approach both be right? That, that question from a bishop might be above my pay grade. Uh, uh, I mean, certainly in the sense of that both are trying to get to a mystery of the incarnation, uh, the mystery even of human salvation, I think it's right. Uh, I would say, uh, you know, certainly Phloxos is a harsh polemicist, so uh, I don't think we would want to try and square all of his, like it would be impossible to make all of his writings, uh, you know, irrenic. But what I would say, if we were gonna look for a core there, there would be two cores. One, he shares this theology of awe and wonder from Ephraim, and two, he's deeply Nicene. In fact, an interesting way to understand the Miaphysite objection to Chalcedon is that they felt that Chalcedon somehow was implying that Nicaea, the creed of Nicaea, was not enough. There's two competing ways of understanding the trajectory of early Christian councils. So the Western view would be, we have the Council of Nicaea, that establishes the Nicene Creed, but there's still more to work out. For example, if you look at the early versions of the Nicene Creed, the Holy Spirit, you know, really gets just a footnote. Uh, so you have further councils. The Council of Constantinople revises the Nicene Creed to fully bring out the Holy Spirit. In a certain sense, from the Chalcedonian point of view, this would imply the church can have ongoing councils that clarify, uh, you know, additional doctrinal points. On the other hand, the Miaphysite reading or the anti-Chalcedonian reading would be the church had Nicaea. At Constantinople, they weren't so arrogant to promulgate a new creed. They just reaffirmed Nicaea. And then you have Ephesus, which reaffirms Nicaea, etc. So when we see a council promoting a new creed, that's veering off in another direction. Um, but certainly, you know, I think both views are a legitimate interpretation of how the church proceeded uh, up to Constantinople. But, you know, you could, you could see how either interpretation could go. Um, but I, I do think that there's a, there really is a core there. Um, in the lecture tomorrow, what I really want to propose is let's look at the places in the Syriac tradition where the authors easily cross lines and sometimes don't even need to have their names suppressed, right? So that Philoxenos, uh, Isaac of Nineveh, etc., cetera, Evagrius, uh, Abraham of Nathbar are being read by Church of the East, by Syrian Orthodox, by Melkites, etc. And there, 
I think we would find a basis for, okay, there is an understanding of how one knows God. There is an understanding of God's work of salvation. Um, and the fact that the churches are willing to share these texts even openly could be a path forward. Uh, at the very least is, is uh, you know, something that should be encouraged. It should, the Syriac tradition should be encouraged to mutually uh, continue to grow that shared heritage. Uh, I hope you're enjoying this. Uh, uh, Chalcedon, from my point of view, like other church councils, sometimes comes up with answers about where the truth, uh, where the error lies. And so what Chalcedon tried to do, I think, is to say what the, uh, the Synod of uh, 449, the robber Synod of Ephesus, went too far. Uh, and so what they were trying to do is to say, we don't think that's where it should go. And so they came up with their uh, formula. And again, and I hope we're probably gonna discuss this again this afternoon. They came up with two philosophical concepts, person and nature. Now here again, we are using philosophical concepts to deal with realities that philosophical concepts from their origin are not dealing with. The whole range of philosophy is what do we understand? And so you could almost say, Chalcedon said, in Christ you have one X and two Ys. <laughs> you could have used any other terms you wanted. Also, I don't think Chalcedon ended the debate. I know it, it stood up now for the last 1500 years or so, but what it did tell us is we know where the answers aren't. And so again, I think this afternoon, I, I'm gonna to try to raise the issue about Mia Thesis. Because here again, you're taking Fusis and you're saying two Fusis somehow <laughs> came into one. Yeah. Now, uh, Cyril might have enjoyed that, <laughs> but is that really an answer? You know, is that really telling us what happened? You know, so you're using philosophy again to say something that philosophy doesn't really enjoy. Uh, again, you know, uh, I'm not gonna, you know me, I always start trouble here. Uh, it's the same thing when we end up with the Council of Trent talking about substance and accidents in the Eucharist. So you, you, you say accidents stay and the substance changes. Aristotle will be flipping in his grave. Uh, you can have accidents in an, an unnatural substance. So, but anyway, that's for another discussion. <laughs> I think along those same lines in terms of uh, another way to think about the point you're making, and you know, since we have so many clergy here, would be from a liturgical point of view, scholars will talk about theologia prima and theologia secunda. Right, so primary and secondary theology. Uh, secondary theology is words that we say about God. Primary theology is words that we say to God. Um, sometimes with my students uh, who aren't clergy but are you know, young people in college, I'll say, which would you prefer, to tell me about your girlfriend or to go spend an afternoon with your girlfriend? Uh, <laughs> and you know, so the words about God, as important as they are, are not what we as Christians know to be the primary words. So that may also be, you know, really the path uh, forward. Sorry to de delay this, but this is really important. So the Maronites kept Christ crucified for us, have mercy on us. And we added Christ later. Oh, so it was but, before. Yeah, before it was just like the Syriac Orthodox. Oh, okay. So, holy God, holy mighty right. one, holy immortal one, crucified for us, have mercy on us. So, our speaking to God, theologia prima, and that's why, oddly enough, the Maronites are a Chalcedonian church, but they speak to God in a Miaphysite form. And, and I think that that, you know, the wording is very nuanced there. So 
the fact that it's saying Christ, Mshicha, mm -hmm. rather than, you know, directly saying Aloho. Uh, but I think you're certainly right. Indeed, uh, I mean, again, we have uh, Professor Darling Young here, too, who's an expert on this. M many people would say that in the councils after Chalcedon, the doctrine of Chalcedon is affirmed, but given the meaning of the Miaphysite position. Uh, so, you know, these are the councils under the Emperor Justinian. He can't repudiate Chalcedon because that's, you know, more or less settled and based on imperial authority. But his attempt to say to the Syrian Orthodox is, okay, we affirm Chalcedon, but we mean by it what you mean by your Miaphysite uh, point of view. Uh, there was another question here, yeah. You had mentioned that uh, Philoxenos had nothing good to say about Leo's tome, but I'm wondering, what was the awareness of Philoxenos like in the Latin West? Uh, almost, almost none. Uh, you know, the, the, the interchange between Syriac and Latin is sketchy. There is, interestingly, I discovered um, Syriac awareness of uh, Cyprian, because once the Syrian Orthodox start to, you know, have competing church hierarchies, all of these questions from the Donatist controversy become relevant to them. And somehow in some of these Florilegium, they, they have some uh, North African snippets. Uh, but uh, no, for the most part, unknown. I, I would say there, Philoxenos, uh, uh, this, this actually goes back to the question of Nicaea and is Nicaea sort of once and for all, or is Nicaea something that can be further clarified? I would say that, that for Philoxenos, the, 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 there seems to have been a period where you could have definitive church fathers, and that period basically came to an end after Cyril. So this is, he doesn't say as much, but the, this my sort of gut instinct is, he looks at someone like Leo and says, well, you're behaving like Cyril, but you know, the time of Athanasius and Cyril is over. Uh, which, of course, you know, the, how would one determine that? And also, obviously, uh, Pope Leo did not think that. And, uh, you know, again, it, it has to do with these competing ways of understanding the conciliar uh, process and authority. The, you know, you mentioned about Nicaea being sort of reaffirmed by the Miaphysites. Mm -hmm. And isn't it, if I remember correctly, the the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed was introduced into the liturgy by the Syriac Church, wasn't it? Wasn't that correct? Hmm, around, that, that, around that time period. That's interesting. I don't know if Peter the Fuller. Yeah, Peter yeah, the Fuller okay. is right. That, so, that, so, I guess that's right. Which would be because they were trying to reaffirm it, and then of course then the whole church they didn't want to re remove it once it's <laughs> right in there. so the the other thing i would say is i do think that there's just a sort of groundswell of nicaea remember it's not until the 480s that the church of the east officially adopts the nicene creed oh, yeah. so and that's not due to resist like when they adopt it they're like yes this is what we believe but also like we weren't invited to nicaea <laughs> and you know it it just didn't come up until right. then <laughs> Uh, Thanks. so, uh, I mean, I guess te technically they were invited, but the border guards wouldn't let them <laughs> exit the Persian Empire to go. They didn't get their visas. That's right, that's right. The invitation got lost in the mail.